Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 151st of Korea Podcast. Our today's guest is Mr. Kenny Wo. He's a visual development artist at Paramount Animation Studio and also an instructor at Brainstorm School, which we're going to talk about in a bit from Los Angeles, California. And now, before we begin, of course, the quick mention to go check, to check out the caption. You can see his Instagram uh, ID, his art station, his personal website, and also his Twitter. So, you know, those are the plugs that you can check for t- today's guest. And with that being said, let's jump into the first question. Give us a little introduction on how we got into the world of visual arts and design. Basically, what was that spark that made you go, ah, I want to become an artist? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's funny, like... I, uh, I, you know, going into college, I, I was trying to do pre-med before and, you know, it's just kind of the thing that I was kind of told to do. And, you know, it was the, it was the very popular thing of, you know, of, of, out, out of me, my friend group and family and stuff like that. And I think like two years into it, you know, I just realized I just didn't like it. You know, <clears throat> I just, um, I was, you know, I was doing my tests. I was doing fine. You know, I, I wasn't like failing or anything, but, um, you know, I, I had to kind of like, I don't know, sit down and, and think like, do I want to be doing this for the rest of my life? And I kind of just thought back as, you know, when I was a kid and I, I drew a lot, right. I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. Right. I didn't think that it was going to be a career, uh, move or anything. It was just, I just happened to draw in my free time every once in a while. And then eventually that kind of led me to decide, Oh yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I can draw for a living. So I was like, well, I like cars and then I like drawing and the initial spark kind of happened to where, Oh, maybe I can be a vehicle designer. But then, you know, uh, eventually as I was diving deeper and deeper into the uh, art field, I started kind of figuring out what I truly liked and, uh, you know, exploring different avenues and eventually led led to, to where I am now in uh, visual development for animation. So that's interesting from med school to art. <laughs> it wasn't med school, it was pre-med. So we were just, uh, it was like still undergrad. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't that good. <laughs> no, but still, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, so you kind of explained to us like, you know, about your background, but here's the thing, like if you could, you know, say something to your 18 year old version of yourself um like just here's the challenge of it but you could only say just one piece of advice not a couple of things are advice right if you could say one thing to your 18 year old self what would you say man that's that's tough you know so there's so many things right it's uh it's um you know an 18 year old me didn't uh didn't know much uh you know i'd say like just, you know, do whatever it is that you want to do and just be good at it. You know, um, the thing, the thing about me growing up as a kid was, uh, I was just kind of told what to do, you know, uh, you know, people believe that, oh, I should be doing these things. You should, you should do this. This is your next step kind of thing, you know? And, you know, I never really enjoyed things. I was kind of known as a, uh, as a kid that, uh, kind of drop things really easily, right? You kind of get into things and there was no like drive or motivation kind of keeping you in it. And it's because, you know, oftentimes it really wasn't my choice to start doing that thing, whatever it was. And it took us, it took a second, but finally when I made a choice to do what I wanted to do, um, you know, something in me kind of changed. And if, if that could have happened earlier, I think that would have been really cool. So, but uh, you know, yeah and well i mean in the introduction i already mentioned that you're a visual development artist and but here's the thing we want to get a little little bit more in depth like what is your main branch of design that you're working on right now and tell us about your experience from the start of it until now i mean and also there's this thing like you know when you get into art then after a while you realize oh i need to be professional at it then you have to like you know actually become like be specific at a certain field like you be you should do, for example, go to illustration, concept art. Then after that, it gets more specific and specific. So you basically have to become a specialist. And that's the whole process in itself. And also explain to us how that process went for you, that you stumbled upon visual development. Yeah. <clears throat> so I guess for the first question, you know, from how it started to where I am now, like, uh, so I guess 
from uh, I'm originally from uh, from Texas. I was going to University of Houston, and then uh, once I decided to make that switch into something more art related, um, the f- the first thing that I uh, kind of fell into was uh, Noman School of Visual Effects. So. Uh, my uncle was moving out to California and I decided to move with him and I took about, uh, I, I, I get accepted into the course and then took, uh, the, uh, took the three year track. I only did one year of it, but I did take, I was in the three year course. <clears throat> and then after that first year, you know, I, I kind of started thinking like, I don't know if I like modeling that much. I, I really enjoyed the uh, the concept art aspect of what we were learning, right? Because uh, that first year is kind of more like drawing fundamentals and painting and stuff, and I really enjoyed it. So then that's when I kind of uh, was stumbling around looking for things, and then I found Brainstorm. That's when uh, 2015 is when Brainstorm School opened. Uh, you know, the first term, and I was uh, part of, initially part of that first term, and. From there, it was just full force concept art. And then after about uh, two years of, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, <laughs> um, I eventually uh, got uh, picked up by uh, my, you know, mentor and boss, uh, James Pack. Um, he, he, he runs a, a uh, outsourcing studio called ScribblePad Studios. <laughs> Where you know he kind of trained me from uh, junior level artist to eventually I became uh, the lead lead concept artist at that studio uh, after about three years, and then from there I wanted to kind of spread my wings a little bit and and learn under other other people and you know uh, kind of develop as an artist a little bit more. So I decided to um, go over to a studio in the Bay Area in the uh, called uh, Machine Zone where a friend of mine was working and an art director that I uh, was familiar with uh, was working, where I got to learn some new things and experience things a little bit more on my own, you know? And then from there, I got uh, hired on to um, a, uh, a, a, pro- a, a world-building project at uh, Sony Music, where I was a senior concept artist. Uh, well, they, they called me senior, but I was the only concept artist there, so I was head of concept internal external where i got to kind of uh you know kind of just develop a whole world right i was the 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 sole image maker and just kind of developing all the visuals and and, and really moving into a uh, a more uh free and open type of position you know and then from there i went into uh, netflix animation uh i got i got picked up by uh a really good friend of mine, Jason Shire, and then here now I'm uh, working at uh, Paramount Animation. <clears throat> so that was a kind of like you know jump step from you know multiple different types of studios, from like mobile games to movies to to even the music industry place to you know animation itself. And then uh, after that, you know, I just. <laughs> You know, I just really liked uh, animation. You know, I, I think something about animation really, really spoke to me ever since the beginning. And now that I'm like kind of in it, it's it's been really fun. You know, I, I really like the storytelling aspect. I really like the uh, the uh, the life and uh, the 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 colors and 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 everything about it, the stylization that you can do in this animation medium versus like uh, versus like movies, for example. You know. Yeah, definitely. There's something like about the animation itself. Like I don't know, like when you working with your studio and your team, like you know, for six months, like I don't know, for like three minutes or five minutes. I don't know. Like basically, it depends on the animation of how sophisticated you want to make it go. You know, you know yourself. Um, but you know, after you work and sweat and and work so hard, like on a piece of like let's say for example, ten minutes of animation, for example, in six months, and you actually like you know see the result at the end. It's kind of satisfying. It's like you climb, you can see the result of that mountain you guys climb, and yeah, I think that that's kind of like you know could be a romantic idea in itself. And yeah, um, yeah, that's the coolest thing, right? Like mm-hmm. <clears throat> my 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 one of my my first studios I was at, we were outsourcing so you know we kind of get an assignment and then we send it back and you know this that's kind of the end of it you really don't see it too often <clears throat> or at least whatever final form it kind of ends up being 
but you know, uh, in in the, the the studios I'm at now, slash some of the studios before, you know, I'll make something and then I'll literally hand it off to somebody else and watch it kind of get developed, and then all of a sudden it's on the screen or it's in a game or it's like you know you're kind of messing with it. And it's it's so surreal, you know, because you remember thinking about oh yeah, I was, I was designing all these parts for it. I was thinking about how this thing moves and there it is you know it's 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 insane yeah interesting and um speaking of like you know the work process i want to ask you this how does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a project like basically what does a pipeline of your structure look like <laughs> yeah um i guess generally speaking or i guess to to kind of uh to 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 start that right i my I guess my skill set it really is uh, more in the earlier development, right? I am uh, kind of in more blue sky development and uh, the more kind of early pitch work. So right now, for example, we're kind of thinking about the world, trying to gather inspiration and get first looks at things. And that's kind of where my skills excel. Uh, so for me, uh, in my workflow, uh, usually I'll get maybe some sort of like a script uh, you know, a small paragraph, a uh, some sort of launch material, just it's like no imagery and it's basically they don't have anything yet. And what they say is, oh, yeah, so this is the kind of base idea and then go for it. So what that entails is usually I kind of do some legwork. I'll uh, do some research on some of the initial things that I, that I kind of that kind of popped into mind as I initial uh, when I initially heard the the prompt or whatever it is. And then I'll just start gathering reference, uh, maybe for like a day straight. I, I'm, I, I really like just kind of getting immersed in the world in terms of just gathering reference and making sure that I understand all the pieces that I'm putting together. <clears throat> and then after that, I'll usually just go straight into uh, creating the, uh, the, uh, the initial kind of images through, uh, through Photoshop. So I'll do some sketches, um, you know, photo bash or, or, uh, or, or paint it depending on what style you know need, uh, I need at the end, and then just to tr- basically try to get that initial image out of my head as quick as I can. That way, we kind of have something to work with. You know, I can I can sh- I can show the directors and be like, "Does this work for you? Is this something that uh, you like?" And then I can kind of uh, build and, and branch off from there. You know. All right, and. Um... <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, I already, like you know, saw in your um, saw in our Instagram and also our station that you're also an instructor at Brainstorm School. Like you know, for everyone who doesn't know, Brainstorm School is a school that was founded by John Park and uh, there was another artist. Uh, I forgot. James Peck. Yeah, James Peck, and um, yeah, they're really great artists themselves. And um, Brainstorm School. Tell us about your experience as a teacher and also. Your experience of uh, you know teaching world building specifically because that's I think one of the classes you do right. Yeah, so <clears throat> you know teaching at uh, Brainstorm is great. I uh, you know like like I was saying earlier, I, I started there. I, I went to school there. I was one of the first students that kind of was you know taking classes there, and you know I really uh, I really enjoyed it because the way the way they uh, run Brainstorm is. You know, they, they hire professionals, uh, professional artists that have industry experience uh, where you, you have a not only the skills of understanding the topic that you that you're teaching, but also the, um, you know, the the, I guess, uh, professional experience to kind of back it up. Right. Because, you, you know, how like you learn something in school one way, but it's you know oftentimes in a professional setting done, you know, slightly differently or they kind of skip some steps and stuff like that. And I think with that uh, that combination of understanding the fundamentals and basics, as well as that professional experience, really creates a uh, a really strong you know teaching environment for the students there. So, as as for my experience there, it's it's been great. You know, um, I feel like the students that uh, you know that I've 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 been fortunate enough to teach in uh, my world building two class and my ENT one class. Uh, it's been it's been amazing, right? Uh, they, you know, I learned from them just as much as uh, they learned from me, right? Because, you know, I'm only teaching kind of like my uh, my experience and and what I've kind of gone through and 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 problem solved things that that I've had to do, you know. 
but it's fun because when you get, you know, a batch of 20 students per term and you've been doing it for, uh, you know, uh, this be almost a year and a half mark at this point, you know, you get like a hundred students in a hundred different ways to solve a problem. And it's, it's so interesting to kind of see how, uh, how these students develop with the, the information that you give them, you know? Yeah. And, uh, well, here's the thing, um, for most of us that are like, you know, are interested in digital art and, you know, we're in this field, um, one of the main inspirations was, and it still is video games. And also I'm mentioning this because I see that beautifully framed, like, you know, Nintendo, like uh, behind your back. Mm-hmm. And so what is one of some of your, like, you know, favorite video games growing up and also the video games that inspired you? Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, like, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, that's uh, that's my uh, Game Boy that I bought. And I, kinda, I I just wanted something to do and I wanted some I just moved into this new apartment. I wanted some decorations and I just bought a broken Game Boy. It, it's it looks exactly the same as the one that I had as a kid. It's a, a, a clear Game Boy color with uh, Pokemon Silver. And so as a kid, that was my favorite game. It was it was also my only game for for, for a while. But you know, I loved it. I played it every day. Like you couldn't separate it from me, you know? And then, you know, as I got older and I was, I guess, able to understand more difficult games, <clears throat> I started getting into the Final Fantasy series, you know, uh, Final Fantasy VII, uh, you know, classic. Uh, one of the uh, one of the bigger inspirations for me uh, in terms of games. And then from there, you know, just a lot of like uh, fighting games like Street Fighter, uh, you know, King of Fighters, uh, Smash and all that stuff. I uh, I guess as a kid, I kind of played a little more um, story driven games. But then as I got older, I guess more coordinated as well. Uh, I started just playing a little more competitive games because I just I just enjoy that competition. You know, I just, uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, I, I've kind of been like that. So. All right, and here's the thing, like, while I was asking this, of course, of course, I realized I messed up by saying Nintendo instead of Game Boy, but besides that, um, there's another thing I kind of realized that I was like, hmm, one of the games that really, shit, some of the games that really, like, you know, not necessarily were my favorites, but they kind of, like, you know, they, they had that, like, you know, memorability aspect for me, like, you know, which was Gears of War 2 and Fallout 3 and... Here's the kicker, I realized. Gears of War 2 is from 2006, and Fallout 3 is from 2007, and I realized, wait, I'm, I'm officially old now. It was, <laughs> it was 14 years ago. Yeah. God. <clears throat> it's, it's insane, man. Um, you know, the new, uh, the new Pokemon uh, Arceus came out, right? Not that long ago. Yeah. And I was like, I remember playing Blue, right? And it's like... Like my brother had blue and I remember thinking like these graphics are insane. You know, this is like the craziest thing. And it's not like, it's not an old game to me, you know, mentally, I I remember playing it, but then just playing through the new game now, I'm just like, man, this is crazy. Like how far things have come in just my lifetime, you know, not to mention, you know, everything that came before me and and everything that will come after, you know? Yeah, definitely. It's crazy. And, um, yeah, let me ask you a particularly hard question that I don't think it's hard, but, you know, a lot of the guests <laughs> says it's hard. Don't worry, it's nothing personal or anything like that. <laughs> um, it's who are your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most? Man. Yeah, no, that's a good one. <clears throat> you know, because there's, I guess there's so many artists that like uh, I kind of reference as as I'm working and as I'm de- as I'm developing. You know, um, I think uh, there's there's a couple different types of artists that uh, inspire me for like different reasons, right? So, for example, I think uh, one of my more prominent inspirations currently at the moment is uh, like Alberto Mielgo. You know, um, he. Uh, his look, his style, his his graphic approach, and uh, just painting a style for me is so cool. Like just how to like simplifying something to its like core elements and really making it feel real still, you know. <clears throat> so that's the uh, I'd say that that's one of the bigger ones. Um, you know, I really enjoy uh, Ryan Lang's work. Um, you know, super inspiring. You know, character uh, character artists. I just visit artists in general, but you know, he he does a lot of character stuff. And even as an environment artist myself, 
um, you know, it's still really cool to see the the story storytelling and the in the moments that he can kind of bring it, it in his images, you know. And after that, you know, uh, artists artists like uh, James Pack and, and John Park, I think for me are are in- inspiring, not only because of the work that they do, which is uh, you know amazing and mind blowing, but also like you know I know them on a on a more personal level, and seeing how they navigate you know, the industry, you know, the things that they do and the, the, uh, I guess the, uh, the, the value that they can bring to their clients, you know, their students or anything that they do for me is one of the more important inspirations that I have. You know, I think for me, art is, you know, one aspect, like the, the visual aspect of art is one aspect of like kind of what makes us, uh, you know, strong designers, right? But there's also, you know, the business side. There's also the uh, the management side. There's also, um, you know, the 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 more guidance, the you know, teamwork aspects, and all those things. And um, I think John Park and, and James Pack, you know, do that in spades. So, all right. And here's the thing I forgot to ask you. Like I just remembered. What do you think about the soul, like you know, Pokemon collection, card collection thing? Do you do you own anything? Do you just you're probably, of course, you're a fan of the game and franchise, but you know, what do you think about it? <clears throat> you know, there's there's always like uh, there's always like that flavor of the month kind of thing. You know, um, you know, I don't want to say it like that. Not not in like a bad way or anything. Um, you know, I had Pokemon cards growing up. You know, uh, you know who didn't, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I just, I, I just haven't gotten into it lately. I know a, a couple of my friends, you know, have really dived in and I, I, for me, I just, you know, I'm just not in, into it as much, you know, this, uh, I, I enjoy the cards for what they are. You know, I, I enjoy the art and I enjoy the, you know, the game that's, that that's played, but, uh, in terms of like collecting and, 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 you know, uh, running into like stores and trying to, trying to buy up their stock, you know, I, I don't know if that's, if that's for me, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's kind of insane that, you know, people, there's like, even, I'm not really into it. And here's the thing, I, as a kid, I didn't grow up with Pokemon. So maybe, of course, you know, if I did grow up as a Pokemon, I would have a different feeling. But like, you know, there's like 200,000, 250,000 Charizard, like holographic cards. I don't even know what that means, but it's kind of insane. Like it just for for because of the sheer vastness of the cultural impact of uh, and how popular it is that's why it's so valuable but it's kind of weird to like you know trying to like how technically could you like you know evaluate something like that like an item like that because i don't like maybe i'm ignorant about it but basically um like how does one evaluate something that is just valuable in terms of like you know the cultural impact, you know, not necessarily because of the material, not necessarily because of the cost of production, you know, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it kind of makes you think when it comes to like, you know, even stuff like NFTs, you know, mm-hmm. they're kind of similar in that sense. What do you think? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, it's it's really as valuable as we we people, you know, give it give it that value. You know, it's uh, you know whether whether it's um, you know something that is. Uh, you know, something that's going to change the world, you know, who knows really, you know, uh, it's for me personally, you know, talking about more NFTs than Pokemon, right. It's something that I do feel has potential to be something, right. I, I think it's still so early staged right now. And, uh, you know, there's, I, I, you know, if, if you're not, if you're not totally informed by it, you can kind of just look out and see like, Oh, it's just a, it's just a cash grab. You know, it doesn't really quite make sense. But if you dive into it a little bit, a little bit more, it's just, it's just in its early stages, you know, and people are scrambling to kind of figure out like, what can we do with this? Because it's, it's, it's officially like kind of put value back into uh, digital artists. You know, I think before, you know, there was this outside of the entertainment industry, right? There was this, I don't know, uh, judgment when it came to digital art, you know, it's like, Oh, you just do it on the computer or, or it's, Oh, it's just a, it's just a JPEG file. You know, it's, it's not an oil painting. It's not something I can hang on my wall. Right. And I think for me, NFTs are, are, are breaking that barrier for us. And, you know, maybe right now, right. Some of the things that we've seen, you know, whether whether you like it or not, I don't know if that's going to be, the track that we take from here until, you know, a hundred years from now. But I think it's a really cool start, right? Finally, 
digital art is getting that respect or getting that uh, that look at that you know traditional art has gotten for you know thousands of years or however long it's been hundreds of years. Um, so I definitely think that it's it's going to be something. I just I just don't know. I just don't quite know what it is right now. You know. Yeah, that those are actually like great points, and I hundred percent like you know I agree with the fact that you know in the at the end of the day it's like you know gives. Uh, it puts a lot of respect on, like you know, the whole uh, discipline of digital art in general, and it actually puts a lot of eyes on that on it. You know, there's so many people mm-hmm. who transition. I mean, of course, here's the thing: there's there's both cons and you know and you know pros with everything. You know, but I but I also like you know believe that is it has a lot of potential and future. But unfortunately, like you know, basically right now the ecosystem is not that very like you know um, healthy. I would say, uh, <laughs> like like most of it, not all of it. Because here's the thing, like in the in last year near like the January the, and the end of the fall, the fall of 2020 was the time that the NFTs kind of boomed, you know, I don't know if you remember. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah. Uh, during the time, you know, a lot of people like are, as an artist, you try to find, you know, different source of like, you know, income, incomes or, you know, re- different ways to, you know, make some revenue, increase the revenue you have, your salaries. You sell prints, you sign up on Etsy, you sign up on Redbubble, so that's six and all of that stuff. You, you know, do all this stuff. You sell courses. But then at that time when the NFT boom happened, a lot of artists were like, okay, this is a new way to make money. And a, a lot of those good artists, like, you know, that are actually like, you know, um, had solid work, you know, they they were like, you know, instant successes back in the day and they're all still, you know, successful. But then after that, because people like unfortunately a lot of people just smelled money came into it and <laughs> i mean here's the thing I, i'm not trying to like you know act like i'm so i'm so I'm sort of say that i don't look for money you know everyone does but you know what i mean like it's so like disgusting seeing this like you know these famous athletes managers probably like i can imagine telling their athletes like hey hey dude look at this nfts this ape just made like two million dollars let's make an nft and a lot of these athletes are making nft collections and it's so disgusting like honestly like just trash art for the sake of like you know ripping off their fans like that's literally yeah. the only thing <clears throat> and yeah jesus there's so much it, it needs a lot of time you know and I personally think like a lot of people who kind of set the culture, set the tone of the like you know what's selling or not are the collectors, and a lot of these collectors I are not necessarily are not necessarily connoisseurs of art, and they're mostly people who got rich off by buying like Ethereum and Bitcoin early on, and yeah. um, I think after a while maybe maybe not even a year later, maybe like two three years late, later or even more I, I don't know like I'm just saying like but. It's, I think, inevitable if the world doesn't end by that time. Um, I think that actual taste for art will change in the NFT market and um, people, like, actual good art will be, like, you know, will be, like, the major topic of, like, you know, what's going to be, like, sold or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, um, I think right now it's so early, right? I think... uh, you know, sometimes you kind of see it everywhere, like, oh, NFTs are dead. Like, people that are outside of NFTs uh, are kind of like, oh, I stopped hearing about it, so it must be dead. And I think for me, it's still so early. I think we're, you know, maybe even a decade away before we really figure out how this changes, you know, our our society, like the way we do things. Sorry, there's a siren going through, if you can hear that. But uh, I think... It's the same thing with the internet, you know, like, uh, you know, in the 90s, who was using the internet? You know, what's that useless thing going to be for? And then, you know, gave it some time. You gave it through the 90s, through the, you know, even even till the mid 2000s. That's when everything, everyone's like, oh, we can make a lot of money off this thing. You can, you know, you can, there's so many opportunities to be had and we're still figuring things out to do with it. You know, and I think it's the same thing. Just, you just got to give it time. And once that kind of wave of initial people kind of either go through or, you know, the, the buzz kind of dies down and, and people find a, a strong utility for, you know, an NFT that brings value to people, I think that's when we're going to see some really big changes. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I agree, like a lot of these initial collectors and things like that, you know, maybe they don't have the art at, at the forefront of their mind whenever they're buying these things, you know. Uh, which is which is true with a lot of things, but you know it's. I think given time, uh, it, it can be something that's uh, really valuable to everybody, not just artists. You know. 
Yeah, definitely. And um, all right, let me ask you a question that I don't ask. I usually don't ask everyone. You know, like some questions are specific enough for some type of artist, but this time, you know, at this point where you're are a professional working in the industry and you had a lot of other professionals working in different studios, you know, teaching and all that stuff, I'm gonna ask you this. Any advice and tips for a good portfolio and resume for artists who want to get break into the industry? Like, you know, some in your experience, of course, what really helps? Yeah. Um, you know, as somebody that is often looking at portfolios and, you know, um, even in my ENT class, uh, I kind of help students build a portfolio. The, the biggest thing that I that I recommend, right, is showing studios that you know what you're doing, right? It's not about, uh, you know, it's not all, it's not completely about your ability to draw and paint, right? If you can draw well, you can paint well, that's still not quite what it takes to be a industry professional. You know, somebody that get hired onto a project has more skills than that. So when you put together a portfolio, it shouldn't be a collection of your best work. It should be a collection of work that works together that you can show to a studio that gives them confidence like, oh, hey, he knows what he or she knows what he's uh, they're doing, right? <clears throat> and what that means is, you know, you create a um, let's say let, let's say this like kind of epic keyframe, right? Where you know the soldier is kind of running through a crowd or whatever, right? And and this cool epic scenes kind of happening. The keyframe, the the this is the what I always call like the money maker shot, right? But then the next couple pages that you have. Have those pages that support that, right? If there's a if there's a guy running through the scene, what's that guy look like? Give us the turnaround of that. If he has a weapon, what's his weapon design look like? And how did you get to that, right? Because when we hire somebody, we're looking for somebody that we can hand a task to and they can just kind of take it and go, right? But if, if they're not showing that they understand production pipeline, it gets really hard to hire somebody, you know? So art skill is important, right? That is the first thing that we kind of see, but that understanding of how that job works, right? As an environment artist, you need to show not only can you do environments, but you can do breakdowns, you can do different camera angles, different views, and you can show, you know, the next person in line how to, you know, uh, build out this scene, right? Because we as concept artists or visual development artists, uh, understanding that we're not the last person to touch this work, right? Oftentimes we're the first or one of one of the the earlier people because these, these images need to be handed off to somebody. They need to be uh, given to an animator, given to a modeler, VFX, directors, whoever, and they need to understand what it means so they can build this set or uh, build this level or whatever it is, so really showing those that understanding is the uh, the core thing that i try to push whenever i'm i'm talking about portfolio things all right and what are you working on that you can tell us about i mean of course if there's no NDAs involved um in that case what are you working on right now ah uh, i don't know if i can talk oh well, okay so i guess uh Right now, I'm, I'm I'm working at Netflix Animation uh, as well, uh, doing uh, doing a project called Blue Eye Samurai. Uh, I think I think the title was announced. You know, we can't show any work or anything, but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's it's going to be this um, this this samurai uh, kind of revenge story, and it's uh, it's really fun. I think for me, it, it's really groundbreaking, and interesting. So uh, definitely definitely something to, something to keep keep an eye out for. All right. And um, what area beside the area you're working on right now, which is, of course, in the art, like, you know, um, discipline, would you be interested to explore and learn in the future? It could be something completely not related, by the way. What other things you're interested in other than art, basically? You know, yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> for me, um, the things I'm interested in now are oftentimes not art related. And the reason I say this is because, like, uh, they often tie back into art in some sort of way you know i think uh you know recently i had been getting into uh um uh programming and and, and creating like uh, raspberry pi uh projects and stuff like that i made a you know like i said earlier i was into street fighter 
So I made a a Raspberry Pi uh, kind of arcade box where, you know, you have the buttons and the stick and everything all tied into a Raspberry Pi that I had to kind of program out. And for me, like, it was really interesting because for one, I'm learning a new skill. I, me as a person, I just always, I'm just always into learning something, you know? And then uh, also, you know, going back into art, it's cool. Like you're kind of thinking a little bit differently and you understand uh, these different mechanisms or these, uh, these subjects just a little bit deeper. So when you start designing, you bring in these new ideas that, you know, you didn't have before, right? Because as artists, you know, we're, we're kind of hired based on our experience, right? Like when they, when they want to see our work, it's specific to us and how we grew up and how we see the world. So uh, the more experience you, you have in various things, it's, uh, it's always really cool to kind of see uh, that infiltrate the art somehow, you know? All right. And well, we've reached the final question and section of the podcast, which is called Final Work. And let me explain what it means. Imagine in the limited amount of time that we have, we like right now in this window of time, you have an opportunity to say anything, a message or any messages to anyone who's potentially listening to this podcast at any point in the future. If that's the case, what would you say? Huh. <clears throat> you know, I think, uh, you know, anybody listening to this podcast and, uh, it was to, uh, for, for trying to get into the, the, uh, I guess, visual development concept of our industry, correct? Um, not necessarily visual development. There are artists from multiple, like, you know, creatives. It doesn't have to be, by the way, an art, like, you know, advice. It could be anything from a human to another human, anything like, you know, kind of like that. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. The biggest thing I would say is, uh, just just do what you like, you know? Um, I think there's, especially with, uh, you know, some of the circles that I grew up around and stuff like that, there's always this idea of, uh, you know, um, you know, is, does it make money, you know, or does it, uh, is it, is it safe, you know? And I, I think something that, uh, really hit home this past, you know, two years because of, you know, everything going on really showing that really there's not, a lot of safety in a lot of things, you know, people that jobs that, you know, you, you, you take because you feel is safe. All of a sudden you get let go because of, you know, uh, you know, the things that happen. And obviously, you know, it's, this is a very exceptional situation, but, you know, for me, just, just, just do what you want to do and the money will come. Right. And it comes back to that advice earlier where, you know, whatever it is you want to do, just be good at it because you know if you if you do something that you really enjoy you're going you're going to put that much more time into it that somebody else won't right that extra hour that you need to stay up or 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 that uh, that little bit of motivation it takes to push past that level of enthusiast into professional right it takes you know that little bit of little bit more motivation and if you enjoy this thing it's it's going to be that much easier to, to do it. And once you get good at it, you know, money will come, right? People will pay for your expertise. You know, if you know how to do something, if you can provide value to somebody's life through the skills that you have, that's what's ultimately go- going to be your safety net, you know, providing value to people. Um, so just do whatever it is you want to do and just be good at it. You know, it's, uh, it sounds, you know, <laughs> it sounds kind of like, woo woo, but at the end of the day, you know, nothing is safe. And, you know, if, if nothing's safe, you might as well do something you want to do, you know? Yeah, that's definitely right. And um, here's the thing. I'm kind of like in the same boat with you because here's the thing. I have like a plan to get like a, like a, like I'm not actually a professional artist or even an amateur artist at this point, like, you know, to be honest, but like my goal is to get good at 3D so much that by the end of April, I can get my first commission, whether it be modeling or texture, it doesn't matter. And, mm-hmm. you know, if I don't help, all right, it's fine. I'll probably go find like a job. I could probably be a waiter or dishwasher at a cafe or something like, which is not bad. Like I'm not saying it's bad or anything, but I'm just saying like, you know, at worst comes to worst, you know, you probably like, you know, get a job like that and it's fine. You know, it's not the end of the world, but my goal is to like at the end of the day like make my living out of art which is like you know that's the goal for now and mm-hmm. thank you so much for coming by where can people contact you if they had any questions 
Yeah, you can uh, you know contact me on my uh, my Instagram at Kenny Bo Art or uh, my art station as well. Uh, say all same tags uh, throughout all my social media and, and yeah. All right, and thank you so much again for coming by, and thank you to anyone who tuned in and listened to this episode. I hope you're enjoying this new format of the graphics and uh, like you know of all this. Uh, podcast because of course i haven't designed it yet but in the for the episode 115 forward i will change the formats and like you know the way the podcast works as as usual you know if there's any comments or suggestions let me know it down in the comments below i will check them all out and with that being said take care everyone have a good day bye bye